Years ago, I stopped at a Ponderosa restaurant in Greensburg for lunch. I was by myself. Uh, the restaurant isn't there anymore, but uh, that day I went in excited because I was really hankering for their sirloin tips. I liked the sirloin tips that they had, uh, but I was told when I walked in that they, they didn't have any sirloin tips. Not only that, they didn't have any steak of any kind. No meat at all. This is Ponderosa. Thank you. But no steaks. They did, however, as they told me, have a great salad bar. And that was available. And they were right. I mean, the salad bar that Ponderosa had at that time had all kinds of variety, all kinds of side dishes. It was really good. Uh, but I didn't stay because I really wanted steak. And if there's one thing that a Ponderosa should have, it's steak. But like I said, the Ponderosa isn't there anymore. I think two other restaurants have filled in there at that building and aren't there anymore either. I, I thought about that uh, story this past week as I was working on the message for today. We are in a series uh, through the Apostle Paul's first letter to the young preacher Timothy, a, a preacher serving the troubled church in the city of Ephesus. It is a troubled church because of the influence of some false teachers in that church who are creating all kinds of dissension and trouble among the members, teaching things that are not true about the gospel, leading people astray. And Paul is instructing Timothy on how to address and counter those influences. And why is it so important, so essential, that the church in Ephesus get back on track? Why is it so important that they get back to the basic truths of the gospel get back to being the kind of community that is truly shaped by the gospel by the good news of jesus christ well because it is through the church that god makes his good news of salvation known and so the church can do all kinds of things and the church really should be doing all kinds of things but the one thing the one thing the church has to get right is proclaiming is testifying to the truth about who jesus christ is and what he came to do and so paul writes in first timothy chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 he says this to timothy i am writing these things to you now even though i hope to be with you soon so that if i am delayed you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. So whose responsibility is it to make the truth known about Jesus Christ? Every single one of us who make up the church. Paul is writing these things so that we would, so that we would all know how to conduct ourselves as ambassadors of the good news why because as he says the church and the church alone is the pillar and foundation of the truth meaning god has left it to the church it is the church's job it is the church's responsibility and really it's the church's privilege to make christ known nobody else no other institution under heaven is going to make christ known except the church we are the pillar and foundation of the truth that's our job we can do a lot of other things and we should but let's not neglect the meat the steak of what we are all about without question paul goes on to say <clears throat> this is the great mystery of our faith christ was revealed in a human body and vindicated by the spirit he was seen by angels and announced to the nations he was believed in throughout the world and taken to heaven in glory. Our one job, church, is to testify to the truth about Jesus. So why does it matter? Why does it matter that we give priority to testifying to the truth about Jesus above all other priorities in the church? 
of all the good things that a church can be doing, of all the good things that we should be doing as a church, what makes testifying to the truth about Jesus job one? Well, because Jesus, and this shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody, Jesus is what it's all about. He is the center of it all. And even more so, he is worthy to be the center of it all. This is beyond question, as Paul says there in verse 16. Without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. Now, when we think of that term, mystery, today we, we think of something that's not yet known, something yet to be discovered, a, a mystery to be solved, to be figured out. But in the New Testament, that term, mystery, refers to something that was once hidden, that was once unknown, but has now been made known, but has now been revealed. So the great mystery of our faith, or as some translations put it, the mystery of godliness, the great thing that was once hidden, but is now revealed for all to see, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the climax to the unfolding story of Scripture, the unfolding story of God's redemption of his creation. The truth about Jesus is at the heart of everything we believe and everything we do as a church. Another way of saying verse 16 is this. Without question, without question, the truth about Jesus is the heartbeat of all we believe and do. I mean, there are many doctrines of the church, many teachings of the church, but at the heart of it all is the truth about Jesus. Jesus. And what is the truth? What is the central teaching about Jesus upon which the church stands and is at the heart of what it proclaims? Well, in verse 16, Paul quotes what is most likely an early hymn of the church, a simple creed about Christ that sums up the core tenets of what we believe about Jesus. And just like the songs or praise songs and hymns that we sing today, the hymn or the creed of verse 16, it's not a dissertation of a theology of Christ giving all the details. It is a summary. It is a highlight reel. It spotlights the essentials about Jesus. And what that does is it provides new Christians, it provides old Christians alike an anchor to hold on to in times of doubt in times of challenge, in times of persecution, in times of temptation. This I believe. This is what I hold fast to. This is my foundation. This is my true north. So let's read it again. Christ was revealed in a human body and vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels and announced to the nations. He was believed in throughout the world and taken to heaven in glory. Packed into that pithy creed are some incredible truths about Jesus Christ. That he was revealed in a human body means that in Christ, God became man. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus is 100% man, but he is also 100% God. So the word became human and made his home among us, we're told in the Gospel of John. Vindicated by the Spirit means that though Christ was rejected and crucified by those that he was sent to save, the truth of his deity and of all that he came to do and accomplish is vindicated by his resurrection from the dead, never to die again. Peter says in his sermon at, the, uh, at Pentecost, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. That he was seen by the angels further affirms Christ's deity by their ministry to and worship of him. The Son is far greater than the angels. It is the crucified and risen Christ who is announced, who is proclaimed, who is preached to all nations 
And in response to that proclamation, many have believed in Christ, have put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Why? Because there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And this Jesus, who was taken to heaven in glory, is certain to return. As the angel said to the apostles after Jesus ascended into heaven, men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. This simple creed is not only for worship, it is a rallying cry. It is an anchor in the many storms of life. It is the mast that we must tie ourselves to when temptations and lies are flying at us fast and furious from all directions. Remember this creed. Remember the truth about Jesus. Hold fast. Take heart. Be faithful. Endure. But the church is not simply to remember the truth about Jesus. Our job is to do what? It is to testify to the truth that we proclaim about Jesus. The church's job, simply this, testify to the truth about Jesus. Now, how do we do that? Well, there's not just one way. We do it in all kinds of ways. We testify to the truth about Jesus, both corporately together, but even individually as we make our way throughout the week. For example, we testify to the truth together corporately by doing what we are doing right now, gathering together for worship. Now, you may not think of it like this, but our gathering here today is making a statement. You made a statement to your neighbors when you pulled out of your driveway to come to church. You made a statement when you said to your kids, coaches, no, they can't practice on Sunday mornings. We're going to church. You made a statement to your family when you were on vacation and you looked for a place nearby to worship. And what is that statement that you are making? Jesus comes first, always. And why is that? Because he is worthy. He is God. He is Savior. He is risen. He is Lord. This past Monday night, thousands of Cincinnati Bengal fans gathered in the cold at an airport in Cincinnati to greet the return from the Bengals from their loss to the L.A. Rams in last week's Super Bowl. These fans showed up in the cold at night to cheer for a team that had lost. Now, what kind of statement were they making about their love and appreciation for a team that had lost. Well, if those fans can show up for a team that has lost, how much more reason do we have to show up and worship and glorify the one who has not lost, but who has overcome the world? <laughs> Showing up week in and week out is testifying to the truth about who Jesus is. And when we don't gather or when we give it such a low priority that we only gather when it's convenient for us, that is a testimony as well to what we believe about Jesus. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. We also testify together to the truth about Jesus by the priority that we give to the spirit of unity in the church what we proclaim about jesus as a church is heard loudest when what we believe about jesus christ and who he is is enough to truly bind us despite all of the differences among us that kind of unity is what jesus himself prayed for the church on the night before he went to the cross to die for us he says, I am praying not only for those or for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. 
I pray that they all will be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. Nofel Staten in his commentary in 1 Timothy writes, it is Christ who saves us. It is Christ who unites us. To the degree that we replace that confession with our pet doctrinal issues, whether those issues be an end times position, eternal security, method of inspiration, women's role in the church, or some other like political positions, we begin to line up with those issues and we bring disunity, disharmony, quarrels, and division into the body of Christ. It is possible for a person to be converted to a doctrine rather than to Christ. No doctrine should have priority over the living and, inter and eternal Christ. As the old slogan of the independent churches proclaims, no creed but Christ. Individually, we testify to the truth about Jesus and our obedience to Jesus. It's one thing to say you believe Jesus is Lord. It's another thing to live like it. Just like it's one thing to say you believe a surgeon can successfully remove a tumor from your body, it's another thing to let her stick a knife into you to do it. Or it's one thing to say you believe a pilot is competent enough to fly you from point A to point B safely. It's another thing to actually get on the plane and let the pilot prove it. In the same way, it's one thing to say Jesus is Lord of your life, worthy to be Lord of your life, competent, capable of being Lord of your life. It's another thing to submit to his lordship in every area of your life. And yet Jesus himself makes a connection between our profession of faith in him as Lord and our obedience to him when he asks his followers, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Those who do obey Christ in all areas of life, they are testifying to the truth about him. And even when they stumble, they still are testifying to the truth about Jesus by repenting of their sin accepting his forgiveness and letting him continue to work on them through the empowering work of his Holy Spirit. We obey not always because we want to or not even always because we understand God's ways, but we obey because he is Lord, he is risen, and to trust him is to obey him. We testify to the truth about who we believe him to be through our obedience we really, test, we really testify to the truth about Christ and what we give up to follow him. I'm finishing up an autobiography by Nabil Qureshi, a man who grew up in America in a very devout Muslim home. He himself was a very devout Muslim. But in his 20s, while studying medicine at Old Dominion University in Virginia, he became friends with a Christ follower. And for the next several years, as their friendship grew, they would often debate the claims of Christ. Eventually, Nabil became persuaded that Jesus truly is the way, the truth, and the life. And yet it was still a long time before he finally called upon Jesus as Lord and Savior and was baptized into him. What held him back? Well, he hesitated. He, he struggled because he knew he knew that if he became a follower of Jesus, it would mean turning his back on his family. Not that he wanted to do that, but he knew his parents would perceive his embrace of Christianity as a rejection of them, and he was right. He writes about that. My parents felt utterly betrayed. It was extremely painful to weather emotional storms, constantly listening to my mother scold me for hours on end. She cried every time I saw her for almost two years, often while painfully indicting my Christian faith for destroying our family. Nabil adored his parents. He loved his family. The last thing he wanted to do was to hurt them in any way. So why did he? Why did he risk 
rupturing forever the bonds of family that he cherished because he was persuaded that Jesus is who he claims to be and he had to make a choice and everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. You don't turn your back on your family like that if you're not fully persuaded that Jesus is who he claims to be. Those who do leave behind, not just family, but maybe a lucrative profession or a comfortable life to follow him, they are testifying to the truth about Jesus. Now, thankfully, not all of us in accepting Christ have been called to leave behind our family or to give up a career or even a comfortable life. But let me ask you, what if it did come down to that? What if following Jesus meant never seeing your grandchildren again? What if following Jesus meant giving up any chance of promotion to an executive role at your company? What if following Jesus meant possible jail time as many Christians face in countries where religious freedom is not an honored right? If any of those possibilities were real, is what you believe in Jesus right now enough to make it worth the cost of giving all of that up in order to follow him. If it's not, let me challenge you to get to know Jesus better. Another way we testify to the truth about Jesus is in how we respond to sorrow and grief. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. In her book, Prayer in the Night, for those who work or watch or weep, Tish Harrison Warren writes about a friend of hers named Julie. Julie. Julie's infant son had to have surgery. And as the nurses were getting ready to wheel their baby boy into surgery, Julie turned to her husband and said, quote, we have to decide right now whether or not God is good. Because if we wait to determine that by the results of this surgery, we will always keep God on trial. And Warren goes on to write, when Julie sat in a hospital waiting room, as surgeons carved her son's tender skin, she committed herself to deciding whether God could be trusted regardless of the result of the surgery. She had to decide if she believed these claims that Christianity makes about God's goodness. She quit the poker game, folded her cards, and decided to trust a God who did not guarantee that bad things would not happen to her or to her son. Trusting that God is good all the time doesn't mean we wear happy faces all the time. No, we do mourn at times. We mourn with those who mourn, but not as those who have no hope. Not if we truly believe the claims about Christ. That we continue to have hope even in the midst of our tears, testifies to the truth about Jesus. Now, those aren't the only ways that we testify to the truth about Jesus. Those are just some of the ways. I mean, other ways include we testify to the truth about Jesus through our generosity, through our pursuit of him above all things, in our, in our gratitude, even in times of struggle. The point is, when we testify to the truth about Jesus in these ways and in so many more, we are making Christ known. 
And when our lives are consistently testifying to the truth about Jesus, that's when we find ourselves presented with opportunities to testify to, to the truth about him with our words. You must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But when your life is testifying to the truth about who Jesus is, you're going to have opportunities because you're going to have questions that are going to be asked of you. Before anything else, the first way, the first way we testify to the truth about Jesus is by trusting ourselves to him. You see, it's not a doctrine that saves us. It's a person. It's not a church that saves us. It's a person. The person of Jesus Christ. He was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died for our sins on the cross, rose up from the grave three days later, and is coming again to establish in full his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Those who belong to him will be raised up with him. Those who do not belong to him will be banished from his presence forever. You know, many people believe all kinds of good things about Jesus, but they're not all saved by Jesus. Only those who see the desperation of their situation who see that in their sin they are without hope, who recognize that only Jesus has done what can save them, that he alone can set them free. Those who do are testifying to the truth about Jesus by turning to him in faith and crying out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he does. His mercy pours out abundantly on those who turn to him in faith no matter who they are no matter what they've done that is good news jesus meets them in the waters of baptism he washes away their sins he raises them up to new life in fact baptism in effect is the first public testimony of the truth about jesus why are you getting baptized because in Christ alone is my hope and salvation. If you haven't done so already, will you testify to the truth about Jesus today by calling upon him as your Lord and Savior, by meeting him in the waters of baptism, allowing him to put to death your old life and to raise you up to new life in him? And if you're already a follower of Jesus Christ, I want to challenge you to examine yourself this week with this question. How is my life testifying to the truth about Jesus? And I'm sure all of us who ask that question will find room for improvement. But as you identify those areas, do so with a humble spirit of gratitude, remembering that growing in our testimony of him does not make us any more saved than on the day when we first called upon him as Lord and Savior. He saves us. He makes us new. All we do is receive it and testify to it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you give us more than enough reason to put our faith into your son Jesus. Lord, whether it's through your word or even the affirmation of things like archaeology or other apologetics about, yeah, there's good reason to believe that your son Jesus really did come into this world. He really did die. He really did rise up from the dead. Whether it's through the working of your spirit in our lives, Lord, we know your son Jesus is real. He is our Lord and Savior, and I pray for any person here who has not yet put their faith in you, they would cross that threshold and trust in you completely. And Lord, those of us who have said yes to you already, 
Lord, may your spirit convict us of those areas in our life where we are not faithfully testifying to the truth about you. Find us faithful to repent and to let you be at work in our lives so that others may come to know you through us, to know that what you have done for us, you want to do for them as well. Not because we have it so together, but because we trust in the one who does. Find this church faithful, Lord, to testify to the truth about you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.